Okay, so we're in March 6th, and then um, we did talk about chapter 8 in our book, which is about um, using um, people and information systems, and how people use information systems. But um, before we get to that point, so in the first part, like we went over the exercises, and we didn't record that, so we can record them for the exercises. But um, the second part will be exactly separate with the first part. I just wanted to make a comment about uh, the previous lecture. In the previous lecture, we saw two uh, videos that were not recorded in the lecture materials, but I put up a, um, a document which has a link to one of the videos we saw. And then I summarized some of the points. And then we also had a discussion on clean. And this figure can summarize it to the real discussion system to this topic. And we had a video about clean that we looked at last week in the system. I think then I put up another set of notes since the last lecture. And this is just in case you want to know more about some of the key words that I said in that video about lean. So we were looking at lean as an example of a total um, policy management approach. And um, they made a lot of, um, they did introduction to lean and they mentioned a lot of the key kind of tools that are used in lean, which is basically concepts and tools. But this is also um, gone into more detail in my subject notes than in the history. So you can use this as uh, to fill in more of your questions about lean, but you don't have to know all of the concepts in certain aspects of the period for that time. So, um, We mentioned that uh, policy management is a um, important strategy between companies. And that's the main concept from all the way Why is that important for the strategic strategies for companies? Okay. Um, and uh, before we actually start on chapter 8, I want to mention that in chapter 8, there's I think it says it's published in 2008. And um, yeah, but many of the articles are from earlier, like 2006, 2007. And in particular, this uh, uh, book talks about a case study in chapter 8 that's made about uh, Nokia. And um, I can find my. Okay, um, okay. Uh, so the case study by Nokia was uh, divided over three pages. On uh, two ten, page two ten, they talked about um, two thousand six. Uh, they were the lead seller of mobile cell phones. And they also talked about um, page 218 has um, the selling volume, uh, low level, low line uh, mobile phones, very cheaply, competing on price, and the selling to foreign lands like China, India, and so forth. And then, uh, so these are the market settings. And then they also said that they were focusing on customer features uh, that were um, that were suited to each of these different markets. So they were adapting the response to each of the markets. And then um, on page 222, they talk about uh, how they get the employees uh, interested 
and cooperate, cooperate in this same team of Lucid Valley Board System and offering a very strong option on different types of um, post and post in teams and training programs and partnerships with universities. So there's kind of an um, in, in internal incentive for uh, people working for me to uh, contribute to the company in part of this area. So these are some of the concepts about how um, uh, this company takes use of um, people and how in their organization how they use the information system. But what I wanted to do is put in an additional update on the right here. And this is uh, what I'm going to show you is kind of related to the question that I used from the exam last year. So, the exam last year also had a question about um, disruptive technology. And although I'm not going to talk about disruptive technology today, I just wanted to give you the update on the case that we know people can use this on this time. So on the time there was a question about um, um, the following case study that made it on the example of the impact of the type of technology and company that had the world of former leaders in the mobile communication sector. But what happened in this case in the development of the from the subject technology using the six step model from tracing system. And I'm not going to talk about this one, but I will talk about that when we do the disruptive test. Because I suggest that the new deal to do is to address the challenges of disruptive technology. And then, so we can we will come back to this case study again and talk about this when we talk about that chapter. It's in terms of what the company is doing. I think uh, we can spend more time on, on the case than what's presented in the um, exam. So I'm going to be sending an extended set of notes uh, that in the case. So I'm going So, um, this is a uh, blog um, involved by the Christian Thompson, and it is posted in 2016. And we are talking about uh, the company that we made it up, and, and it, how it did um, the going from, and um, why it has been defined um, in its own self and so this is the uh, graphic trace to make the uh, so full volume uh, both in emerging, in emerging markets like the uh, China, Asia, Pacific, and Middle East, Africa, and North America, and the, um, and the total volume. And it says um, that um, they were at the high point in 2008, and that their volume declined. Significantly, so we had uh, units sold in developing countries with success, and the units sold in the entire global market within the region. And uh, the fifth portion of the volume is in the emerging markets, and the market is selling mobile technology is broadly. And then there was a high point in 2008, and this. I think I'll just find the difference the whole time. And then uh, the reason is, and then we also noticed that the decline from the non um, developing countries was greater than the decline from the developing countries. So they lost more money than they lost in that area. And this shows that um, uh, turnover and operating 
profit. And um, so it's significant. Needless to say, the company market share has declined significantly. It did gain from 40% in 2007 in the years up to the introduction of smartphones. And I know here again, market share on a growing market. So you can see that the profit for the peak in 2007. I'll be the other side for the eight to have the most market share in 2008 to be profit in 2007. And then, um, the operating profit has four stars and the blow that in 2010. And then this one says that, um, and you know, this is uh, market share in the next quarter. And that's the peak in 2007 and then down. In 2015, it's even more than 2015. Okay. And the uh, operating margin um, also funded, so it has a um, um, decrease in volume, it's not in size, but it's not in the market. And then it says, um, And an explanation for why this is what happened is because of the declining uh, average and selling price um, for the phone. So that means that the, um, the phones were becoming um, more like commodities and getting cheaper to carry a lot for a modern phone and then the phone for phone from them. And they were selling a uh, large volume from the other thousand countries, but the cost of going to move other countries is low, and the so the average selling price for the phone is just constantly dropping. And that means that they want to compete on price, it is a price competition, and not a one on one based on uh, differentiation. Okay. Um, this shows the notice that quarterly taking position from 2007 to 2010. And it's worth noting here um, that um, um, in, 2008, so in, the, in 2007, Apple introduced its iPhone. And um, in 2008, the iPhone was sold globally. So this was a new kind of uh, technology. That was introduced, and um, at the time, uh, we feel it's um, exactly in its strongest point in the fourth quarter of uh, 2007, when this new technology was introduced. And at the time, they had uh, in their presentation based on um, they had said that enterprise is going to have a large product portfolio. Uh, this way, every flag stock uh, contains at least two full flags and with new product launches. Images below come from some of these presentations. So these are the products that have a lot of different different things available, different types with different looks and features. Because they said in the article in this, that they considered becoming acceptable. So it wasn't just for communication, but it was just for them to just be cool to have them make their phone because they were at the time they were quite small and people really liked having this kind of flip in their phone in their pockets. And um, so they had many new products. And then um, even uh, this, this one is uh, from 2008. This is it was not much new on uh, technology. So um, it said that uh, Associate Professor Mary Gummer, Minnesota University, has shown that their stock market pricing and analysis closely ignored uh, Kodak and Kohler, which they took in 1990. So what they're saying is that even though they were 
given to the new product, they were not paying attention to the new technology. So, the what they were paying attention to was not scary and very small things, but they were not paying attention to um, new opportunities and new things. And uh, in the 2008 second quarter, the their uh, report, which is reported, uh, major mobile devices and uh, market share increased uh, sequentially. So it's uh, being present in the growing market can be highly deceptive because growing demand might obscure the fact that the technology is about to become obsolete. But sending a false message to incoming time things are actually going well. This was indeed the case with stem uh, cells for Kodak in the 1990s. And um, with the market kept growing and increasing, uh, demand concealed the fact that the technology was going to pass, which reduced the incumbent from expensive positions. So the same thing we said that in the years ago, that um, because the um, market kept on the top of it, it did. They didn't recognize the new technology at the time. Basically, a new operating system that was by Apple. And yet, they uh, didn't, they were trying to put on a feature on the existing operating system rather than uh, looking at and um, changing the software, the basic software that they need. So, um, this is some. Um, starting to pay attention a bit to the software, but they still have the same operating system, and they still have uh, the same. They are operating on features like getting music from the online studio, but they have to do so even the same operating system. And he says that um, at, at this point, uh, the company is recognizing the software is becoming more important, and that phone calls used for a wide range of different purposes. But the response to do more of the same once more future funds with different functionalities and hanging on to the by now outdated operating system changes. So the you know, software was important and could on to doing the things, but they still hung on to the uh, embedded um, knowledge and the, the, the use of the Symbian uh, operating system. It says in their financial reports, there was still no statement about the switch to smartphones, except the an amazing piece of denial in the fourth quarter of 2008, no deal it is long term strategy to use dollars on income. So they do not recognize the importance of the smartphone new technology in any any fourth quarter of two thousand. Um this is in two thousand nine. They start to mention the mobile industry from the phone is the biggest in the next years history. So here they're finally recognizing something has happened that um, the people are moving to smartphones. And this is something that's happening to the people from the world and um, to reach the third point of their future. Um, and he says that um, about two years after the launch of the iPhone, the shift towards an open model with application developers, uh, the company finally announced that it's going to be something uh, at all. They just said, well, two years is a very long time. So they're talking about this. Uh, they, they started to uh, introduce the software by a store, an online store called OV Store. And, um, they were going to adjust their business services and say it's like a model so that other people could contribute applications to the service. So okay. And then uh, the oldest color, it says now 
thousand over one million downloads per day. And um uh, as the old as businesses they still remain unintegrated, mainly since UPR refused to do anything about any performing operating system. So there was I think some collaboration with some other providers and the security for it and then we're separate from um, it says uh, in the fourth quarter of, of 2009, the society has ability to ramp up new, more compelling offerings despite a tough competitive environment. So there's a sudden recognition in the fourth quarter of 2009, which has uh, been starting to lose market share. And then the first quarter of 2010, as Nokia continues to show solid, smartphone momentum in lower price points. So in 2014, this is the first time they mentioned uh, smartphones. And so this is also the first time the word smartphone is used in their uh, uh, presentation. So, But they're still using Symbian um, operating system that comes from the Pixel 3. And so here it says that um, in quarter 2, 2010, Nokia for the first time communicating that it's doing something about its old software. Uh, WordPress has increased speed and innovation. We need the fact that now that the company is still doing more of the same, they're still trying to compete with files by developing the software. So, Oh, <laughs> yes. So they're, they're um, trying to improve their Symbian operating system, but there's no competition for the operating system. And then, um, uh, the third quarter of 2010, that's what this is from. Shows that um, this slide feature is a new Nokia uh, product and portfolio of phones. <coughs> so sales declined 20%, and in the second quarter of 2011, it went down 25%. In the, oh, I mean, in the third quarter of the same year, it's kind of like down 25%. And then, you know, in the late 2010 and 11, in the presentation, it comes from either that. I'm um, dry that it probably makes sense to look at them. <laughs> uh, but they're looking at um, increasing execution, module control, uh, and they're hoping for smooth and innovation. So, um, there's some kind of bond. Um, and he says that um, um, the phone mm-hmm. collapsed in the coming year. It's new CEO and um, uh, Stephen Mellick stated in 2007 that the first iPhone shipped in 2007 and we still don't have a product that is close to their experience. Android came out. On the scene just over just over two years ago, and this week they took our leadership position in smartphone volume. So they're looking at it as a um, some uh, performance of the phone, and they said that um, this is the future phone for Nokia, and that uh, at the beginning the Smartphones can be uh, they they can be the same as the future phones, but the performance of the smartphones exceeded 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 that of the future phones, and so the adoption system from this adoption to this adoption set, and that um, the performance of the phone from this perspective. To be prepared for them. And then they pointed 
that originality from the left hand perspective. As Sindhian was essentially defined uh, for some future calling and sending text messages. Uh, the online functionality of Nokia phones remains uh, poor. A smartphone is much more about software and online compatibility than future phones. And Nokia was, in fact, really quick to develop smartphones as its competencies were more related to hardware. So this has to do with a cultural problem um, where we said that there were actually experts in hardware and in the operating system and software. And they didn't have the internal competency to uh, recognize and change the software because it was a problem. So they lost the money market for what are some of the fixes for the market? It's kind of heading off those that they can go into partnerships with others that have a market share and they have expertise in software. So they could um, try to do that. Um, and um, I haven't checked um, the status today. No, no, no. But I mean, are they still in existence? <laughs> um, they're, they're still selling these lower end systems, so I think it's just kind of. Okay, so they partnered with the principal. And that's. Yeah, so that was the solution was to partner with the principal to establish um, that market. Because there's like, there's, I mean, we've got different kinds of markets. So we have still the people that want to have some kind of basic platform. But there may be still market that just want a low end platform to do the sort of basic communication. So, like my son, he has a piece of phone pocket in the package. And, like, my daughter, she has the, the top phone, so I'm too happy with that. But they're different in different uses. And even in, that's within this market, in many places, like, um, in the um, developing countries, don't have the infrastructure to support the smartphone. So they can even use that. So we felt that they need to have the ones that do a little bit more with them to support it back and forth to do the with anything. So, um, yeah, it's uh, not hopeless. So we can see and in get into other markets and probably we didn't need to find um, quite a different <laughs> Okay, so um, this was something about this chapter that um, they're talking about uh, how uh, people, and when they talk about people, sometimes they're talking about the customer, and sometimes they're talking about the people working for the company, and then uh, it's like how people work with IS systems, and, and they're also talking about culture, so everything is within the context. And we need to look at them. Like on the page, page 12, is this figure 1 8, and it says the complex of computer based information systems. And they have repeated again that um, these systems uh, work well in internal complexes within organizations when it supports the culture of the organization, when it supports people. If people feel they do better with the technology, then they may need to accept the technology. And so it has to be accepted within each of the contexts. And um, so whether you're talking about customers or co workers, it's going to be the same type of business. You need to work within the culture and the context of the organization. And I'm going to continue to do that. And then, um, yeah. So, I would just do this concept. Thank you. 
they're doing the processes and what they they have to do, and they're more likely to support it. Um, and then the last point on this slide is that uh, people interpret uh, different types of systems in different ways. It's always a like subjective point of view. So that um, uh, one of the key points is to in fact just uh, question. And if you're designing something, uh, you can consider the space that you're using the system. Which is it? You know, who are the companies? Who are the customers? And you know, who's involved in what are the systems is used in life? And uh, you have to be you know, um, accepting that everybody's different um, views are about it. So uh, if you want to avoid miscommunication, you have to be able to accept that there's going to be different points of view from different stakeholders groups, and that these are all valid points of view, but it's different. And you need to be able to present it as a way of expressing your views. And then you will. Uh, if you're aware of this, how uh, you should be able to avoid communication problems with the public more. Okay, so here's the figure we've been talking about. <laughs> and you see that uh, this is the thing in the system, this is the thing in the public environment, and this is the thing in the other external environment, which is the specific system that it comes to. Um, another philosophy to talk about is um, human computer interaction. And that's uh, about ergonomics and also has to do with disability. And um, it says that uh, HDI seeks to understand both computers and human beings. So it's uh, that's common we can how people interact with computers. And mostly they say that at least in fact people interact with computers using a high standard. And um, because of the kind of systems we have, we've been most uh, concerned with safety and computing things. Because when we use our computer, we're reading the stuff on the computer. And we have, uh, later on, we have sound, but then we're still in the same message. But we still don't have so many um, interactions with the computer system. Using taste and smell, and now touch is becoming an issue because now we have touch screens. Before we had keyboards, and then we can kind of even map things like the fact that we're not only getting touch screens, but even uh, sometimes, like the map is in front of the hand, you know, the map is not even in 3D map, so that you can move around between the touch screens and the 3D screens. And then there's different kinds of systems for people that aren't able to use big hands that they are um, deep down and they can, or they tend to lose their furniture. So maybe they have to use second down with the stick on their arm and on the arm and pull it. They can pull things to the head or they could use a light screen to use the machine. And now we have kind of um, trying to develop systems so people can train a person to move around by the way they think rather than like the time to learn. But they have to get this electromagnetic wave from the brain and be able to tune the system to the rotation in the basic So more opportunities are coming up for interaction with computer systems. And um, um, some of the things that people I looked at the working kind of location where that uh, screen layout and design puts uh, too much on the ice cream, uh, which is like the CPT too complex. So when people were designing it, it's okay to do that. The use of cutters, the use of pen maps, those things would uh, rotate on the screen and so forth. And um, uh, we talked about five principles of interface design are. Maximum consistency, relevancy, supportiveness, and flexibility. And 
and uh, relevant capacity with um, only putting out information uh, that we need for the task we need to do. So we don't want to find redundant information, we don't want to not have enough information that we need to fix the other mind. Um, and then supportiveness, how easy is it to use the system? Um, you know, that might have to do with how things can be presented. Because about people not being able to can you can remember numbers that they talk to nine seven um nine seven and they can the number of the world um who are on seven numbers. They can remember seven numbers plus nine two seven nine seven. And they can remember more numbers if they come from together. So like they tell someone that because you put them in group in your head, you can remember. But since they think I'm able to throw numbers on my phone, I don't remember any numbers. <laughs> but at one point, I used to remember for the few numbers. <laughs> and um, but, but, but the amount of the number is something. And then the uh, limited uh, flexibility. Um, uh, it says that there's different kinds of users. And that uh, you need to be able to the, the, the different users have different kinds of requirements and skills and preferences and background education. So it seems that um, like when people were using a uh, banking machine, so it was fun. And nobody knew how to, um, nobody was educated in how to use the system. So they had to. They had to expect that the people who came up with the definition of the system, some were old, some were young, uh, some had experience with computers, some didn't. They had to develop the system so that the interface was suitable for different types of users. And that um, uh, this can have some, uh, make it difficult for the issues of um, consistency because um, when you make a system that's uh, Flexible for different types of users. They may make the interface not perform the same way for different types of users. So you have to kind of balance uh, flexibility and consistency. And uh, like one of the users here is that people need uh, for people with disabilities can be maybe the user cannot see very well, but they cannot hear very well, so they cannot. Um, this is a model that is called Unified Theory of Acceptance and Use of Technology. And this model is based on the earlier model. The earlier model is called CAM. The two classes, which were to see the usefulness and to see the user. And that uh, they found that the relationship to use and whether people not to actually use the technology, uh, was to assist in relationship between use and the first of stronger and the first user relationship. And the reason is that um, it's a 
that um, for online shoppers, for example, how uh, that greatly uh, um, devalues information quality. Uh, so more likely to use some to use online shopping. And those who value the uh, service quality are less likely to use online shopping. So um, this had to do with the perceived uh, usefulness. So they were more, I mean, they weren't concerned with um, whether or not something is going to help them or not, and not how easy it was to use it. And, um, um, so this was, I think this was kind of more related to actually what, um, this, this is the same thing. And this kind of was related to the service. I 
think it's going to be hard to use this one to see the use of sleep. And then do other people in the class use this to solve this problem or do they use something else? So these are all the tactics we can learn and we'll also see some people's individual background and then we'll know you get a choice. But it um, also comes down to the specific things. So a lot of people use it. I don't know if some of you use this, but I've heard of this model before. This is much simpler, but this is small pieces of other conditions. There's also a case on page 219 about um, ACL. So the electronic prescription system of the Netherlands Ministry of Health. And they say with information seen as supporting the culture, there's no likely to be accepted. And this means that it had not so much to do with these differences. Performance expectancy and expectancy, and also expectancy, because they didn't care whether it would be the job or not, and they didn't care whether it was part of the learning, but they cared about whether the culture was accepting or not, as to whether they would accept it. So, in that case, they found the top factor that was more important than the other two factors. Um, Uh, this uh, question about um, the camera all the time. Uh, we have um, uh, this. Okay, this was from the other one. Um, Um, there's several theories of design, and some look at um, uh, whether or not uh, the motivation for using the system comes including intrinsically or extrinsically. And uh, we think it usually means there's some kind of internal reward system that uh, you feel you want to use something because you want to use it because you feel it's improving yourself, the skills, and um, uh, that's sort of the big reward for doing the task that you were self-improving. It uh, comes from within the group to decide to start to do something that can be like your life that I would say can be a benefit to you. The next thing in terms of uh, motivation is that uh, something is coming from the outside to make you change your mind. And that may be like better pay, or better job security, or promotion. And so, you, and when you're doing something, you just like someone else is encouraging you to do it. So, it comes from the outside. And then, um, um, this is kind of related to the case study that I have put in, um, in fact, in period. And, um, because we don't have enough time to really talk about the rest of the stuff, and I'll really continue with it next time. So I think we'll learn to and pick up on it.